number 3. Uh, we're going to be going through verses 1 through 11. Again, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 11. If you will, if you can, if you're able, stand with me as we read the word. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 11, and Paul says this, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Verse 5, Mortify or put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. But now you also ought to put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we pray that your spirit uh, would teach us, uh, your spirit would convict us in areas that we need to be convicted, uh, that your spirit would heal us in areas that we need to be healed, and then most of all, your spirit would make us look more like your son. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Uh, you've heard the old saying, uh, dress for the job you want. Uh, maybe, maybe you've said it to your kids. Uh, maybe a boss has said it to you, implying that you, need to, you might need to go do some shopping after work. Uh, maybe it's something that you, you've lived by in your, your professional uh, career. Well, the meaning behind that phrase, I think, is, is pretty clear. It implies that the nicer you dress, the, the better job you'll eventually get. For, for example, if, you're, if your job requires simply a, a collared shirt and some jeans, uh, if you want to maybe have a higher position, then you ought to dress up to that higher position. So maybe instead of wearing just simply what's required, you maybe throw on a tie, maybe throw on some nice uh, pants. Uh, in other words, the, the thinking is uh, it'll make you more efficient. It'll make you stand out among your peers. Uh, the thought is that the way you dress then directly impacts uh, the position that one is in. Or if you want to put it in reverse, uh, the position that one is should be reflected by their dress. Uh, Paul says something very similar to us here in Colossians 3, 1 through 11. He uses this clothing imagery uh, to tell us or to describe uh, the Christian's past lifestyle and then contrast it with their new lifestyle or their new position. In short, those that are in Christ are to take off the old clothing and to put on the new as we will see, Paul is obviously not talking literally about clothing. Uh, he's talking about a person's character or a person's lifestyle. Therefore, much like a person's dress reveals their position, a person's character or lifestyle should reflect their position as well or who they are. Again, I think this could be said possibly better in the reverse. Who we are should affect or impact how we live. For Paul in our passage this morning, our position or our status ought to be reflected in our lifestyle. And his main position, his main argument, his main point is that new creation, as new creations in Christ, we are to take off the old self and put on the new. The position there is important. 
as we are already new creations in Christ, we are to do this. We don't do this to then become new creations. That's very important. We are new creations, therefore we do. He's going to make this argument in three ways. First, he's going to show us who we are in Christ. This is foundational. Who we are in Christ. Second, based upon that position of who we are in Christ, he's going to exhort us to live that out. Right? To take off the old self. And then thirdly, as new creations, what do we put on? How do we live in light of that? So given that pattern of Paul's thought, we're going to break it up into three sections. Uh, we're going to walk through them according to his thought process. We're not going to be able to get to 12 through 17, which is that what we're supposed to put on. We're not going to be able to get there this morning. There's just too much here, and I want to be able to do the passage justice. So we're only going to get through... First, foundational text, 1 through 4, who we are in Christ. And then verses 5 through 11, what we are to take off. And then next Sunday, Lord willing, uh, we'll be in 12 through 17 to show us what we are to put on. So I think in order to do this properly, we have to look at the context uh, around the passage as we always do. So Paul, as we know, we were in Colossians last week even. Paul has been uh, combating or confronting these false teachers uh, in Colossae that have been teaching that salvation or freedom is found in Christ plus something else. We see in uh, chapter 2 verse 8 they were saying that freedom is found in philosophy and empty deceit. Uh, Human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world. Those teachings sought to, to, to bring freedom, such as those that we see in 2.16 and then verse 18. Uh, we see these things like food and drink restrictions. We see festivals, new moons and Sabbaths, asceticism, worship of angels and visions, etc. And what these false teachers were doing were coming in and saying, yeah, Christ is good. Uh, you, you need Christ, but you also need to obey these things well in order to experience salvation and in order to experience true freedom. So essentially, they were seeking to add to the finished work of Christ. But as we saw last week in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, Christ is supreme over the original creation. He's supreme over the new creation. And because of that, He is sufficient in reconciliation or in salvation. Paul tells us, For in Him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Him, who is the head of all rule and authority. So for those of us in Christ, Paul reassures that this is all we need. Christ is all we need. In Christ, we read in verses 15, God has made us alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. How then can that which Christ triumphed over add to Christ's work in triumphing over it? This is what Paul is saying. In Christ... You are filled. There is nothing that ought to be added. For Paul, Christians have died to the elemental spirits of the world, as we see in 2.20. If this be true, he's talking to the believers in Colossae, why then would you submit back to regulations that have the appearance of wisdom, but lack the power? For Paul, those of us that are in Christ have been buried with Him, We have put to death the old self with sin and death. He says, in which you were also raised with Him to live a new life as a new creation through faith in the powerful working of God who raised you from the dead. Therefore, for for those who have by faith been united with Him in His death and resurrection, we continue to live on earth in our mortal bodies, but we have embarked on a new way of life. And it's that new way of life that Paul is interested in here. Not embark on a new way in life and then be found in Christ. It's because of who you are already in Christ that you embark on this new way 
of life. But we first have to understand the foundation of who we are in Christ. What is our new identity? How are we new creations before we can understand how we are to live as new creations? And we see it in verses 1 through 4. If you then be risen or raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. So these verses, what they entail, are the foundation for what follows. So following on the heels of what we just spoke of about how we are full in Christ, how we have died with Him to sin and been raised to new life, Paul begins there. He says, if you then are risen or raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits. Here, risen with Christ means that we have been given a new life. We are different than we, uh, we live differently than we did before Paul in Romans 6, 4 writes this, We therefore, as ones who are baptized into Christ, were buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. So what we see here is that those who are raised to new life by grace through faith in Christ are now called to seek this is an imperative. It's, an, it's, it's a call to action. We are to seek those things which are Christ. Essentially, our faith, the Christian faith, is, is one that ought to look different from the world around us. Precisely because the adherents to it do not look like the world. But they shouldn't look like the world. We don't take our direction from the world. Paul says we seek that which is above where Christ sits. We see many following after a, a wide array of religious systems that says, if you just do a little bit more, you're going to get there. Right? We see many that follow after worldly powers that say, if you just get a little more, then you'll be there. Many follow after that inward call of self that says, if you just live according to your feelings and your desires, then you'll discover your true self. But Paul tells us something radical here, and I think Dick Lucas does a good job of expressing Paul's intentions. He says, the distinctive mark of the new faith is that in the old accustomed sense of the word, it is not a religion at all. It is not a human system linked to earthly sanctuaries, regulations, and rites. It has no essential center of authority in this world, for its center is the heavenly Christ. Neither is it an exercise in interior spirituality, mysticism, or visionary enthusiasm. Set free from sub such subjectivism, the Christian is simply a man or woman who has been granted a relationship with the exalted Christ at God's right hand. This relationship he is vigorously to pursue and develop by seeking the things above. Psalm 1, uh, 110 tells us that uh, uh, before Christ came, uh, or, or before Christ, uh, before he, he, he rises, before he uh, is finished on this earth, Christ is, is at the right hand of the Father. Where his enemies have become his footstool. And what does this signify? It signifies that Christ is victorious over all the powers and the principalities of this world. So Christ is already there. It's coming to a point where all of his enemies will become his footstool. Christ, Christ is already sitting at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, the one that is in Christ ought not seek those things which Christ is already victorious over rather he or she should seek Christ alone I think Lucas again is helpful here he says to seek the things above takes us to the very summit of Christian experience in this life it is daily to hold fast to Christ as the center and the source of all our joy it is to enter his gates and praise and come to his courts with thanksgiving in short this is where we are to live well, certainly we are on this earth right but Paul is telling us we ought to live here where Christ 
is. Lucas says this, living in Colossae, the Christian also lives in Christ. Both are home to him. Same is true for us. Whether you live in State Road or not, Christ is also your home. You are at home with him. But this living, this being with him, this new life, it implies an something that we ought to do, a lifestyle that we ought to, uh, to embark on, right? We are to seek those things which are above, and in verse 2 we are told again, set your affections on things above. What are those things? Well, it's what we're going to see next week, verses 12 through 17. Those are the things that we are to put on, the qualities that Wright says of self-giving love that are the chief characteristics of the life of heaven. It's those things that are implicitly contrasted with the things that are on earth where we've already seen in chapter 2, what we're going to see here in verses 5 through 11, and the things that we are to put off. As we will see then, by seeking those things above, we will inevitably have to take off the old man. We're inevitably going to have to put to death some things in our lives, and then put something new on. But before telling us what to take off, what to put on, Paul continues in verses 3 through 4, and he reinforces what comes before. We are to seek those things above, set our affections there instead on, uh, uh, instead of the things on earth, which is going to find its expression in 5 through 17. And Paul says this, because you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God, and when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we also appear with Him in glory. It is here where, where Paul briefly summarizes for us the true Christian's status. With Christ, he has died, right? He has died, he is risen, and he will appear in glory. As we discussed last week, the new creation has already arrived in part in Christ, the body, the church. We, we belong to that body. However, the old age is not yet done away with. Right? We're still living in this world. But according to Paul, this new creation or new life is often hidden from the world. As we live in this broken world, this new life is often hidden in this world. Precisely because our life is bound up in the heavenly places with Christ. But our hope is that one day we will appear with Him in glory. So verses 3-4 through four reveal to us our security in Christ and our hope in Christ. When we think of the early church, when we think about uh, maybe the persecuted church that we, we prayed for this morning uh, all across the world, security is not often what comes to mind when we think of that, is it? Security or hope. Luke records for us in Acts 14.21 about the preaching of Paul and Barnabas. Luke says, strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith, he says this, we must endure many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. What Paul is saying is that the church here and now may not look victorious. Even in areas where persecution is not necessarily a reality, oftentimes the church just looks very plain, right? Very ordinary, very unimpressive. I mean, if we just look around this room, if you look up here at me, the, w the world wouldn't look at us as glorious or as victorious or very impressive. Lucas writes this, There is comfort here as well as shame. For if the body, us, is marked by humiliations, so in his earthly ministry was the head, though himself without sin. Identifying himself with sinners, he was made sin for us. It says, How impossible for the man and woman of the world to see the glory of God in the man on the cross. To the world, Christ is not glorious. To the world, his, his church now is not glorious, but Paul assures us in verse 4 that there's coming a day in which Christ will appear in the fullness of His glory, and John reminds us that in that day we shall be like Him. John says we don't know exactly what that entails, but we will be like Him. N.T. Wright says, Then will it be seen with what faithful diligence and perseverance many outwardly unsuccessful and forgotten Christian workers have served 
their Lord. He continues, Paul the prisoner, an eccentric Jew to the Romans and a worse than Gentile traitor to the Jews, will be seen as Paul the apostle, the servant of the king. He says the Colossians, insignificant ex-pagans from a third-rate country town, will be seen in a glory which, if it were now to appear, one might be tempted to worship. This is how they and we are to regard our life. And on this foundation, we are to build genuine holiness and Christian maturity. Brothers and sisters, look, in a world that follows after hype, Paul says you are to follow after holiness. It doesn't look exciting. It doesn't look glorious. It oftentimes goes unnoticed but it's the very life that we are called to live in Christ. And part of that living this new life is taking off the old man. Getting rid of your old way of living. So Paul is using this imagery here of clothing, of, of taking off, of, of putting on. It's relation to the characteristics of a person that is now in Christ. And what he's saying is that since we are in Christ, since we have a new identity, he says put to death or, or mortify or put away or put off the old life. He continues this imagery of taking off, taking off, taking off, killing even. He says it three ways, but they all revolve around the same idea. That of no longer looking like the old self, but looking more like Jesus. Therefore, as opposed to seeking that which is above, which we, which we are to do now, we used to seek that which is here and now. Paul says, mortify or put to death what is earthly. That which you used to seek after, that which you used to look like, Paul says, now because you seek that which is above, put to death those earthly things. Don't set your affections on earthly things. Here he says to put to death that which is earthly in you or those practices and attitudes which you used to devote your life to. We're going to see it in verses 5 through 11. Paul says in Romans 6, 11, You too must count yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. But what are these things that we are to put to death? We see them laid out in two lists, two vice lists. Verse 5 speaks to sexual sins or sexual disorientations. Uh, uh, verse 8 are distortions. Verse 8 speaks to the sins of the tongue, sins of anger. So verse 5, Paul begins here with these sexual sins. He goes in this list from very specific uh, to, to really just general. He, he, say, he begins with fornication or sexual immorality. It speaks to immoral sexual relations outside of marriage. He continues with uncleanness or impurity. Uh, which speaks to immoral behavior, which actually leads to moral, immoral character. Next, he lists inordinate affections or lust. It speaks to this overpowering uh, passion of, of uncontrolled sexual urges. He continues on, he speaks of evil desires, which is what precedes lust. I think it needs to be mentioned here that temptation in and of itself is not sinful. But Paul's point here is that sin starts with that temptation phase. And if it's not killed, if it's not mortified in that stage, if we allow it to fester, if we, if we coddle it, if we toy with it, it's going to lead to sin. It's going to lead ultimately to death. He finishes this list with covetousness or, or greed, he says, which is idolatry. Now, Paul could be speaking of greed in the sexual sense. We think of, we think of uh, the Ten Commandments, coveting a neighbor's wife. Or he could speak of covetousness in the material sense. We don't, we don't know. But either way, whatever it may be, sexual, material, Paul says these things are idolatry. It's idolatry. That's what they boil down to. Tony Marita writes this, Idolatry happens when we look to someone or something to give us what only Christ can give us. Joy, satisfaction, meaning, and identity. You know, we are oftentimes, I think, tempted to think that these things are not that serious. Maybe not with our words. Maybe we don't say that they're not serious. Well, none of us would say that sin is not serious. But maybe it's the way that we actually live our lives that reveal to us that we think them not serious. Serious. 
But Paul tells us they are very, very serious. In verse 6, he tells us that upon these things, the wrath of God is coming. And those who continuously to choose these things over God, to them the wrath of God is coming. N.T. Wright says the wrath of God is not a malicious or capricious anger, but the necessary reaction of true holiness, justice, and goodness to wickedness, exploitation, and evil of every kind. It's not that God is just running around like a... uh, He's not just running around uh, trying to just put to death people, and He's not just running around uh, with with this unrighteous anger trying to destroy... No, this wrath of God is a necessary reaction, N.T. Wright says, to unholiness. As one who is perfectly holy, perfectly just, the wrath of God is just as well. This is what's coming, Paul says, on these things that we see in verse 5 and verse 8. But Paul does something interesting here in verse 7. I think it speaks to Paul's pastoral heart, pastoral sensitivity. He reminds these young Christians uh, of their identity or their status. He says, kill these earthly things in which you used to walk when you used to live in them. He's reminding here in the midst of this hard teaching, he's reminding these brothers and sisters that because they have been raised with Christ, they now have the power to defeat that which he is discussing in verses 5 and verses 8. Eight. He's telling them as what we see in Romans 6.6, 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Recognize what Paul is saying here. Recognize the order in which he is saying it. You and I are not in Christ because we have first put to death the old man. You and I are not in Christ because we have put on the new man. Without Christ, we are powerless to do this. If, if, if I'm speaking to an unbeliever and say, do what you, don't do what you see in verses four, or 5, don't do what you see in verses 8, but do what you see in verses 12 through 17, I'm just leading them further along in the sin. I'm just leading them further along into death because we are absolutely powerless if first we are not already in Christ. It is because we have been transferred from death to life that we can do these things. If, if I were to just stand up here and preach, do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that, without giving you the foundation for why you can actually do these things, then I don't need to be up here preaching the gospel of grace. What we see here is that, is that, that Christ makes us new and then we live. Christ Christ transforms us and then that affects the way in which we live. Listen, we're not going to be able to achieve this perfectly. Paul tells us in in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed. You're not already transformed. We, We haven't arrived. He says you are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. What Paul is saying is that look at verses 1 and 4, 1 through 4. He's saying, look, you are already secure in Christ. You are being transformed by the Spirit, and one day you will be like Him in His glory. And with that pastoral heart, with that with saying to the Colossian believers, You can't do this without what you've already learned in verses 1 through 4. He moves on to this hard list, this hard teaching again of verse 8. He's saying it's not only these gross sins, the ones that everybody would say are sins that we are to put off. In verse 8 he says, put off also these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication. Put those out of your mouth. These things that are are to put off are, are relational in nature. It doesn't just speak to ourselves. The things that we are to put off, if we continue to put them on, affects not just us, it affects those around us. Here, anger is not the righteous kind, but the kind that speaks of a continuous state of hatred. Paul says, put that off. It's not how a Christian lives. He continues, he says, wrath or rage. 
which is the actual acting out of anger in actions or words. He says, put that off. Take that off. He moves on to malice, which literally means evil. But, but really, given the context of, of relations to others, it means evil with the intent to harm others. Paul says, put that off. He moves on to blasphemy or slander, which puts malice into action. Your evil is intended to harm others. It comes to fruition in how you revile maybe those that are made in the image of God. What does Paul say? Don't walk in that way. Put those things off. Finally, filthy communication speaks to this obscene and abusive language. Paul says, take that off. Those are old clothes. Those are raggedy clothes. Those are clothes that a Christian ought not put on. He says, take it off. He continues on in verse 9 with something else that pollutes our mouths. And that is lying to one another. He says, instead, our tongues are to speak truth. As ones that are in the truth, we are to speak truth. Titus 1-2, Paul tells us that God cannot lie. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4-25, put off all falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For you are all members of one body. Listen, controlling our tongues, speaking truth, this is not always easy. It's not always convenient. But it is always the correct thing to do. Whether it's convenient for you or not. Whether it's hard or not. Speaking the, tr- the truth, controlling the tongue is the, always the right thing to do. For one who has put off the old man. The one that has put off the old ways of living, the one that is being renewed after the image of Him that created Him. This is the rationale for why we should put off what we see in verses 5 and 8 and 9. We should pursue holiness and godliness instead because we have put off the old man and put on the new. In other words, because of your new identity, because of who we are in Christ that is revealed to us in verses 1 through 4, we can now live out the reality of verses 5 through 11 that says, put off that old way. You are dead to that old way. Those are your grave clothes. Don't put those things back on. It's the picture of baptism that we see here. In the early uh, Christian communities, um, When someone would be baptized, when they would come to Christ, when they would be baptized, what they would do is they would remove their old, dirty clothing. They would remove it completely. Yes, that implies that they were naked. We're not going to ever move in that direction, I promise. But what they would do, this is the symbolism here, they would take off the old, dirty clothes. And what would they do? They would then walk into the water. They would walk, symbolizing what? That they have died to that old way of life. They have died to sin. They have died to death. Ain't that an amazing thing? Died to death. They have died to that old way of life. And what do they do? They come out of the water, symbolizing that they have been raised with Christ, and they put on them what? Those old raggedy clothes that they had? No. They don't put those things back on. What they put on is a white, clean robe. Symbolizing they are clean. They are to walk in this new way of life. And Paul is saying the exact same thing to us. Right? We have died to sin. We have died to death. We have been raised to new life. And it doesn't make sense then to put on those old dirty rags. If I go play basketball, I, I, I sweat a lot. I really do. That's why I wear these and don't, that's why I don't take these off. Because I sweat so much. That's, that's probably a little bit too much information, but I do. If I go play basketball, for example, and I sweat, I play for two hours, whatever. If I go take a shower, what am I going to do? I'm not going to put those, I promise you, I'm not going to put those clothes back on. I'm going to put on new, fresh clothes. Paul says, you are clean. You are new. Don't put that old stuff back on. Don't put it back on. You have died to sin. You have died to death. You have been raised to new life and walk now in that newness of life. And we do this because of our new identity. We are being renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created us. Listen, when humanity sinned, though they were in the image of God, that image was marred. But now for those of us that have been raised to new life in Christ, we are being renewed in the image of Him who created us. 
Galatians 3.27 spells out this amazing reality for us. As many of you as were been baptized in the Christ have now put on Christ. It's not just about putting on new works. It's not just about putting on new ways of living. Paul says, you do this because you have put on Christ himself. You have put on his character. You have put on his ways of living. But notice what else Paul says about this new creation, this new humanity. It's not strictly about you and me. It's not strictly personal. Taking off, putting on, it has implication, certainly for one's relationship with Christ individually. But Paul says here, it, it applies to this new humanity with Christ as head, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Putting on the new man has communal or corporate implications. Will harmony and unity be hindered or will it be fostered by taking off and putting on? In other words, if we have sinful attitudes or speech, will that help or hinder unity and fellowship? I think we know the answer. Obviously, it's going to hinder it. If we have immoral thoughts or speech or hateful attitudes or untruthful attitudes towards one another, there's no way we will be able to foster a community of harmony and unity and peace which ought to characterize a body of believers. Paul says this new humanity no longer has barriers, no longer has these divisions which are so important to the world. He says racial barriers are broken down, religious, ethnic barriers broken down, cultural, social barriers broken down. Doesn't mean that they don't no longer exist. It's just that in Christ, they no longer matter. They no longer divide. He says Christ is all and in all. Much like what we saw last week, he takes precedence over all. Therefore, with our new identity in Christ, that identity takes over any other identity that we might have. Bruce writes, the Christ who lives in each of his people is the Christ who binds them together in one. And we can't be bound together if we're all living that old way of life. Who you are, how, how you walk according to who you are affects not just yourself, it affects the community of believers around you. Bruce continues on, and I, I will conclude here. He says, The restoration of the original image of creation will yet be universally displayed. But how good and pleasant is it when, when here and now, that day of the revelation of the sons of God is anticipated and our divided world is confronted with a witness more eloquent than all our preaching and feels constrained to say, see how they love one another. One of the main reasons that people are not coming to Christ in numbers that we would like to see is precisely because they do not see Christ living in us. Instead, they see divisions. They see lifestyles that do not reflect the confession that we make. Until we live out our new identity in Christ by putting off the old self, and as we're going to see next week, putting on the new, facilitating this Christ-like love among us, we can't really expect much different from those around us. We have been raised to new life, Paul says. We've been raised to new life, and this means that we have this resurrection power the resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead allows us then to defeat sin and death in our own lives. This has certainly personal implications for you and me individually, but it has implications for Mount Pleasant as a whole. How we live out our confession directly impacts the one that you're sitting beside, the one that you're sitting in front of or behind. We must live out our new humanity individually and corporately. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that Paul tells us first who we are in Christ. That you have saved us, you have brought us to new life. And that because of that, we can now walk according to your ways. We don't do these things to earn your love. We do these things because you first loved us. We thank you for that love.
Father, help us to go forth, taking off, continually taking off the old man and putting on the new. Father, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. At this time, uh, I'm going to ask Ricky to come up here.